So I want to um, start off by introducing you um, to the uh, to uh, this woman here. This is this is Marilyn Voss Savant, uh, and Marilyn Voss Savant. Um, uh, between 1986 and 1989, she was listed in the Guinness Book of Records as having the highest IQ in the world, which was 228. And the only reason she lost out in the 1990 edition of the Guinness Book of Records is because they retired the category. Um, so you might be forgiven for thinking that somebody like Marilyn, um, so, someone with such a spectacular IQ, would want to be a scientist or a logician or a mathematician or an engineer. But actually, what Marilyn wanted to do was be a writer. Um, and so uh, in uh, the mid-80s, she moved from St. Louis, Missouri, where she was born, um, and she moved uh, to New York City, and she got a job writing for the magazine Parade. Um, she had a weekly column there called Ask Marilyn, um, which invited readers uh, to challenge her with a series of academic questions and logic puzzles, um, which she would do her best to answer in, in, the, in the pages of Parade. Um, so in September 1990, she received this apparently innocuous question from a reader called Craig Whitaker. And Craig wrote, suppose you're in a game show and you're given a choice of three doors. Uh, behind one door is a car and behind the other doors are goats. Um, you pick a door, say door number one, and the host who knows what's behind the doors um, opens one of the other doors, say door number three, which has a goat. And then he says to you, do you want to change your mind and choose door number two? Is it to your advantage to change your choice of doors. Now, some people might recognize this as a formulation of what's called the Monty Hall problem. Um, Monty Hall was uh, an American game show host who fronted a show called Let's Make a Deal for NBC in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, on the show, uh, Monty would attempt to make a deal with contestants that they randomly selected from the audience. So the contestant uh, might be given a prize, uh, say, for example, a brand new color television from the 70s. Um, and they're told that they can keep that prize uh, if they want, they can walk away now, or they can have the mystery box. And the mystery box could be anything. Um, it, could be, um, so it could be something better, it could be a brand new car, for example, or it could be what they refer to as a zonk. And a zonk was almost always a booby prize. It was a room full of broken furniture, or a stack of fake money, um, or on, on more than one occasion, um, it was actually a live goat. Um, so nobody wanted the zonk. The zonk was bad. Um, the most famous game that was played on Let's Make a Deal, um, which is the game that's now called the Monty Hall Problem, um, uh, had uh, the contestant faced with three doors. Um, behind one of the doors was the star prize, probably a brand new car. Uh, but behind the other two doors were zonks, typically goats in most versions of the problem, as told. And the, contest the contestant gets to choose a door, any door they like, in the hope of opening the door and revealing a car. After they've made their choice, Monty, who knows which doors are which and where the prize is and where the, uh, where, the car, where the car is and where the goats are, he opens up one of the other doors to reveal a zonk. And he always reveals a zonk, he never reveals the car. So now there are two doors remaining, and the question is asked, do you want to stick with your original choice, say door number one, um, or do you want to switch to the other door? Do you want to switch to door number two? Now, most people at this point think that this is now, they, they, they look at this now and say, well, this is now a 50-50 shot. Um, so there's two doors, 50-50, obviously stick or switch, it doesn't actually really make much difference because it's 50-50, and in fact, the majority of people in this situation will stick with the original choice they had. So very quickly, just to embarrass everybody here, um, what would you, would you, would you stick or switch? Hands up people who would stick. A few people would stick, okay. Who would switch to another door? Okay, marvelous. Okay, well, when, Marilis, when Marilyn Voss Savant received this question to parade in September 1990, her advice was for the contestant to switch. Uh, the first door has a one-third chance of winning, she said, but the second door has a two-thirds chance. Um, and in fact, as it turns out, Marilyn is right. You do double your chance of winning from one-third to two-thirds by switching doors. Um, but for those of you who would stick and thought that, uh, th that Marilyn was wrong, you're actually in good company, because after Parade printed Marilyn's answer, letters started rolling in. Um, you blew it, and you blew it big, said Scott Smith, PhD from the University of Florida. Um, since you seem to have difficulty grasping the basic principle at work here, I shall explain. After the host reveals a goat, you now have a one in two chance of being correct. Whether you change your selection or not, the odds are the same. There is enough mathematical illiteracy in this country. We don't need the world's highest IQ propagating more. Um, 
Robert Sachs from uh, George Mason University, um, he said, if one door is shown to be a loser, the information changes the probability of the remaining choices, neither of which has got any more, more reason to be likely um, to one in two. As a professional mathematician, I'm very concerned about the general public's lack of mathematical skills. Please help by confessing your error and being more careful in future. The following week, Marilyn wrote a follow-up col column in response to her critics, in which she said, my original answer is correct. The benefits of switching are readily proven by playing through the six games that exhaust all of the possibilities. For the first three games, if you choose door number one and stick each time, and for the second three games, you choose door number one and switch each time. And if you do that, in fact, here are the results. Um, so if you switch, which the, the, the uh, bottom three here are switching, if you switch, you win two thirds of the time. And if you stick, you only win one third of the time. So after Parade printed Marilyn's second answer, more letters came in from more PhD mathematicians who still refused to accept Marilyn's explanation. And my favourite of uh, the letters that was received that second time was this one. Um, I still think you're wrong. There is such a thing as female logic, said Don Edwards, a patronising wanker from Oregon. Now, here is the nub of the problem. Marilyn is right here, and all of those mathematicians are wrong. But despite the evidence being presented to them, they do not recognise that they are wrong. If they'd sat down and they'd done the working on paper they would have realised that Marilyn was right, but they didn't do that. If they played the scenario out empirically with a few undergrads, they would have realised that Marilyn was right, but they didn't do that. They were blinded to the evidence in front of them because they thought they already knew the answer. Now, why would you investigate a question to which you already know the answer? So, how can we escape this problem? How can we avoid the arrogance of these mathematicians? Now, we don't want to just accept any old nonsense um, that people happen to slap down in front of us. That would cause a tremendous mess, uh, including female remedy there, which is a genuine 19th century um, bit of quackery. Um, that would cause a tremendous mess. We don't, so we need to be open to new ideas, and we need to simultaneously be rigorous about which ideas we accept. What we need is some method, some mechanism by which we can distinguish ideas which are likely to be true from ideas which are not. And this is what science is for. As much as science is taught in schools as if it is some sort of corpus of knowledge, uh, this actually isn't really the case. Rather, that knowledge is better understood as the fruit of science. It is the product of science. Science itself is better understood as a set of techniques we can use to figure out what is probably true from what probably isn't. Science makes you a deal. Science says it will investigate your new idea, it will do it with care and with an open mind, and it will be even-handed and fair about it. And if those ideas actually stand up to the most torturous of tests, your ideas will be accepted. But just as importantly, if your idea does not stand up to scrutiny, we will drop it like a hot brick. And crucially, that's what these mathematicians have failed to do. They have failed to discard their bad ideas, not even because they were too, not even because they um, hadn't, uh, they hadn't considered the evidence, but because they were too arrogant to even. Uh, look at the evidence that had been presented to them, instead they preferred to make patronising comments to the woman who presented it. Now these two pillars of open-minded investigation and the ruthless dismissal of, ide of ideas which turns out to be bad are the foundation upon which this entire enterprise of science is built. It's the reason planes fly, it's the reason computers compute, it's the reason why the sum total of human knowledge is accessible from a device that fits in your pocket. These are also the same pillars, um, also form the basis of scientific scepticism. Um, which is what Merseyside Skeptic Society was created to promote. Scientific skepticism uses the tool of science to in the tools of science rather to investigate the claims that people make about the world and how it works. Now we are especially um, interested in claims which could potentially harm or otherwise exploit people, whether those claims are about psychic powers or magical cures for cancer or kind of pseudo profound bullshit. My name is Michael.